the Spirit. Amen. We're in the middle of Advent, the, the Christmas fast, preparing for to prepare ourselves to celebrate the feast of, of the Nativity, the feast of, the, of Theophany, the great winter festival of Christ's appearing. And one of the things I think is really important for us, and the church holds before us uh, in these days, um, especially this epistle reading, um, which is so profoundly theological. And it's something for us to contemplate because you know, very often, especially in, in, in our modern world, all sorts of ideas float around about who Jesus is, and there are many Jesuses, all different versions of Jesus. And some people think that he, is, he was a prophet, and some people think that he was uh, a nice teacher, and other people think that he was a guru. But how many people are there left that believe that he is the incarnate son of God. That he is God who took flesh and dwelt among us. That he is the logos of God, the word of God, who, who came forth from God. And so I'd like to, like to dwell on that for a little bit. In this, in this epistle reading, It talks about he is, he is the firstborn over all creation. Now, that can be misunderstood. And there are plenty of, of, of preachers and false teachers that, that misunderstand that and want to say that Jesus is the first creature. But rather, it means that in him, the creation, through him, the creation came to be. We have the word Theotokos, the one who bore God. He's the prototokos, the first bearer of all creation. It says, all things were made through him and for him. Well, we believe that the word of God was with God from the very... Uh, from before time began. That God always was a father because he always had a son and he always had the Holy Spirit with him. There was never a time when the son was not. There was never a time when the Holy Spirit was not. But from all eternity and from before eternity, if you can say such a thing, God is the Holy Trinity. And through the Son of God, God chose to bring forth the creation. Through his word and by his spirit. There are those who talk about, the fathers talk about, the, the Son and the Spirit are like the two hands of God, working and shaping creation. Yet they're far more than just the hands of God, because each one of them is a person in and of himself. And the three live in an eternal union of communion with one another. And it was by the will of God that creation came into being. That God willed, and so it came to be. He spoke the word. He spoke the word in the word, through the word, by the Spirit. By the, breath, by the breath of his life. And the creation came to be. And the creation is something different from God. We're not what, we're not the, we're not what God is. God's essence is something entirely and completely distinct from what we are. And he exists in a way that 
it is utterly beyond and incomprehensible to us. Actually, one of the fathers said that if God, if you use the, talking about the, the idea of existence, that if God exists, we don't. And if we exist, God doesn't. In other words, you can't equate how we exist with how God exists. And one of the things that's so easy to do is to get lost in all of the all of the complex theological concepts and all of the all of the complex ideas. But really, when we do that, what what happens is that we re reduce God to our own concepts. We reduce God to our own ideas, and God infinitely transcends our ability to conceive of Him. In the liturgy, during the anaphora prayers, uh, both in the uh, liturgy of St. John Chrysostom and in the liturgy of St. Basil, it says that God is ineffable, inconceivable, invisible, and incomprehensible, ever existing and eternally the same. In other words, every concept that we have of God is inadequate. And that's why, and one of, that's one of the reasons why God chose to send his son into the creation. This creation which he had made. This he sent his son to humanity which bears his image that the Son, who is the image of the Father, took on, who is the uncreated image of the Father, took on our humanity, which is the created image of the Father, and thus fulfills our humanity in himself. He became we are, that we might begin to understand a little bit, that we might grasp that he might reveal who God is. And not only has he revealed God to us, but he has filled us with his life and raised us up. Such a salvation is not simply the payment of a ransom in order to be uh, saved from uh, from the wrath of God. Such a salvation could only be wrought by the Son of God who takes us into himself. Into himself. By the grace of the Holy Spirit. So that we can partake of his life. So that, so that he shares his life and his relationship to the Father with us. And it's because of this that we can dare to say to the eternal, infinite God, who is beyond all comprehension, our Father. As we approach Christmas, it, which is the Feast of the Incarnation, it's so important for us to contemplate this great mystery of how God took on our humanity, of how God assumed the totality of our being and became what we are, that he might enable us to partake of what he is. He became an infant, he became a child, he became a teenager. He became a man so that we might perceive his love for us, his mercy towards us, that he might show us the way to live in a God-pleasing life, that he might identify with us in our sufferings and transform our suffering into something that transforms us and 
raises us up closer to God so that we in turn might be able to identify with all others who suffer and to, and to help to raise them up from the pit of despair. So let us contemplate this great mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God who, who came and took on our humanity to fulfill it and to, and to raise it up to the Father that we might be partakers of that life which is the life of his kingdom and might, might share in his eternal life with, with his Father and the Holy Spirit to all eternity. Amen.